Okay, uh, I haven't seen you in a while, and I'm going to, I think my fashion book is going to be, like, free this weekend or something, so I'm going to read you some of it so that you can, like, get an idea of if it's good or not. I mean, it's very good, so that's why I'm reading it to you, so that I, it's proof, like, I'm giving you proof right now of how good this book is, so, um... I'm not going to set this up because I just picked a random page, and uh, this is page 121. You probably need, like, extensive backstory to understand what's going on here, and maybe I'll, I'll stop reading. At some point, I'm going to, like, stutter like Joe Biden uncontrollably, and then I'll give the backstory once my reading level becomes very obviously low. Uh, this, this chapter is called The Backstory. The truth is, my grand return, after being away for so long, actually arrived at the end of a string of non-stop underpaid jobs designing as the creative director of various celebrity-run lines. I always, signed ex I always signed extensive contracts that demanded, above all else, that my participation in any given line remain totally under wraps at all times. The name and face of the collection would receive the buzz of whatever I created. Most celebrities I worked with were West Coast based, so I was able to finally escape New York and its toxic scene. I found it far easier to keep a low profile in a place that was filled with people more interesting than an aging fashion designer. I easily worked in secret because LA is not a fashion capital. Leaving New York freed me from a community of critics that deemed me so unfit to be near a needle that they probably couldn't even get a piercing without being attacked in the internet. In LA, the discussion of cuts and construction was always centered around flesh, not something that covers flesh. I was bailed out by the entertainment industry when the fashion industry decided that I was absolutely unacceptable. It was a new trend which favored my skills. With the collapse of the music industry, record labels had to convert themselves into talent factories. The blueprint was set by bigger acts like U2 and Bono, but trickled down to the new artists simply because their fans could be easily exploited, even if they don't buy records anymore. The record companies became entertainment companies and then became, began to sign pop stars, socialites, hot sluts, famous for nothing, people for 360 deals. These deals resulted in companies pimping the image of their client in every way possible. Sure, the music was still part of it, but the revenue from the Vivo views and the t-shirts and the notebooks and the concert tickets and, finally, the fashion line were all a bigger part of it. I had to, I had to design at such a level that name models could be booked and top fashion editors would be forced to attend my show in a bid to seem current. When we wouldn't do runway, my collections would verge into ready-to-wear territory. Most of the time, the runway show was part concert, so I was able to work fully in the high fashion capacity I'm most comfortable in. The actual line that was sold in stores was created by someone else, not me. A tug of war resulted on some projects in which my style became too obvious and sunk the fantasy that some 16-year-old lip-syncing pop princess in the making was creating beautiful clothing for every moment she wasn't taking a half-nude selfie. I was asked to create more of the amazing pieces I had drafted in the past while making it look like the celebrity client was intricately involved in the designs. Most of the time I was able to achieve a balance by quietly convincing the namesake of the line that my ideas were their ideas. I would Google the star who hired me, then I'd very loosely relate portions of my design which I saw in various pictures. You were drinking water in Santa Monica once and that inspired the wave-like texture of this piece. I would tell them, and they would say things like, yeah, as I was drinking the water, it like became part of me, and I knew it th that it would be used again for something other than like, you know, piss. I became a master at presenting something other than, I became a master at presenting the illusion of choice. That being said, there were some things I wouldn't budge on. I need a big space to design, and I need my mannequins, and I need my team, and I need my corpse brides. Mandy, an incredibly talented makeup artist, proved to be my equal when it came to these brides because, each time, she would switch the makeup up just enough that it was a totally different look, but I, was always, but I would always approve of what she did 
because she took parts I loved, the macabre, the romance, the history of it all, and then she would make it now, for that moment. Purples would be traded for yellows, tiny geisha lips would be Betty booped, Mandy quietly carried out my bidding, and we all left feeling good. The company I worked with consistently kept me employed as their temporary stars continued to have a passion for fashion, then, mere weeks later, a passion for domestic violence and DWI. After I proved myself for a decade, the Chinese investors came calling. They were smart, they saw my work, they felt I did my time, and they allowed me to have my rebirth. By this time I was exhausted. Coffee was down to keep me coffee was down to get me up in the morning. Heineken was a sleep aid. The bar nights and coffee shop dates were my non contractual social events. I filled myself with chemicals merely to get through the damn day, my hands shaking, sticking anemic girls with pins during fittings. My models would march down the runway like purposeful, intense robots, and that is how I navigated life. Eight hours of sleep was the norm until six years ago. Six hours of sleep was the norm until two years after that. Four years ago, I verged on four hours of sleep a night, except for when I'd sleep for 14-hour periods during my off time. I was catching meals in the form of hidden, gra gra hidden valley granola bars that could be sip slipped into suit pockets, pants pockets, and the flap of design portfolios. It was a pint of Chinese food that the model, fresh off a breakup with her girlfriend, brought to our fitting. It was a slice of pizza I ate talking in between meetings. It was an overpriced popcorn I crunched on while catching a late show at the Arclight because I was so hopped up on coffee I couldn't sleep. Everything was compounding. I refused to stop because I was afraid that if I got out of the rotation, someone who worked cheaper, with no baggage, would be designing the collection that they would allow me to get all my emotions out safely. The Chinese, unaware of any of this, swooped in and promised to let me use my name on my own line. No more hiding. It was supposed to be a relief. It was supposed to be a weight lifted, a mask removed, handcuffs sawed off. At the same time I was falling apart, I received the break that I had worked all those past collections for. To merely get through this experience of triumph and trouble, I created illusions to secure everything from collapsing. It was about the custom-made and modified clothes that I made for myself, even as I dropped weight from my already frail frame. It was about the Tommy cologne that always ensured I smelled fresh. It was about the hairspray that kept me from looking disheveled even after the windiest of commutes. If you look okay, smell okay, and you aren't out committing hate crimes, people will think you're fine. You can even occasionally cry, they'll just assume all is well, because frankly, it had become commonplace. Fashion Cut listed crying in their trending section with the comment, emotions are so in this season. The problem with consistently working hard is that someone will eventually take note of your dedicated work and they'll provide you with an opportunity that you always felt you were qualified for. By the time this happens, by the time your hard work has compounded year after year, you should be pursuing a vacation. But no one can wait. No one can understand how you'd pass up your dream just to sit by the pool. So you immediately go to work when it's the last thing you should be doing. Being offered the experience of a lifetime is a shot of adrenaline that'll trick you. Your instincts will say, slow down, but you convince yourself that slowing down could mean death. I know this because I watched from afar as Cassie went through this. She was away too long, always working 12 hour days, the stress aging her. She knew that she'd look even more run down in the future if she kept at this pace and that would stifle her booming career. With every exhale of a cigarette, she would see the face of a younger Cassie in the smoke, and she'd watch it fade away. Later, Sienna went through this, and she ruined the opportunity she always craved. Even Irina, a superhuman by all accounts, took a year off just to travel the U.S. searching. Irina arrived here from Brazil and achieved the American dream within a month but she eventually cracked under the rigorous demands of fashion and set out to discover if America offered anything beyond the American dream. She needed more, if she was going to stay here. She searched across the country and she must have found something to anchor her because she just found Regis 
love, someone who got it. I'm jealous of Irina because I've never allowed myself that vacation and I look much older for it. I've never stepped away from the industry for a breath of fragrance-free air. Lux claims I engaged in self-sabotage, but if I do, it's certainly not intentional. Never once have I felt programmed with the feeling that I don't deserve success, so I will ensure failure. My self-sabotage was always self-neglect, being run ragged and then never mending myself. A stitch in time saves nine has a parallel in my industry. Yet, I still ignored the saying, probably because there were more than nine other voices all speaking to me at the same time, holding up other pieces that also required emergency stitching. My collapse was characterized by shunning social situations because I was simply too busy. Maybe that was an excuse. Maybe I was afraid that someone would detect that I was unraveling and they'd ask me to take some leave while Karen stepped in and simplified everything. The pieces were always slices of my pain. I was constantly afraid that they would infect Karen if she tried to fix them. The clients I found myself de designing for had a blank a blink in their gone shelf life. If I stepped away, I couldn't come back two seasons later and pick up where I left off. In two seasons, the line was always abandoned. The celebrity would predictably clap the celebrity would predictably collapse under the weight that I was struggling to lift, so I'd always stay on. I have a need to be the one designing the line until the tombstone is carved. The completion of the most the completion is the most fulfilling feeling I've had pumped through me. I could never be like Eve's, handing down my name to a worthy successor that people will tear apart. My work is the Alpha and the Omega. I engage in the pinnacle of creation. This process gave me religion and brought me back to God. Now, every day, I work tirelessly to inch closer to him. And then the next chapter is called The Brush Off. And if you want to read it, here is the book, Empire Waste by T. James Reagan. That is your fatigued looking author. Here's the back. We've got a shoulder there. It's $15. The fifth. And I didn't adjust for inflation and I put this out in like 2011. So I'm just I'm considerate of my readership like that. Such a kind and giving author. But that was a piece of Empire Waste. It's probably going to be free, so I don't know why. Just maybe that like $15 is like, oof, too high for me. How about free? Is that too high for you? Probably is because a lot of you are my friends and you still haven't read this book. So please just read this book for poor little Tommy Reagan. Have I guilt tripped you enough? All right, it's like a thousand degrees in this car. I don't have the constitution to be here in a New Jersey heat wave. And so I'm going to leave you. I hope you have a nice summer. And if you're by the beach and you want a beach book, don't buy this one. <laughs> buy my book, Beach House Burning. It takes place on the New Jersey shore. That's a way better beach book than that for a beach book. But also maybe like buy this one too and... Um, Give it to your hot friend as a gift and be like, it looked like you needed a beach book. And I just so happen to have an extra in my little beach bag here. Let me put some suntan lotion on your shoulders while you read. All right. <laughs> Always ending on a creepy note. <laughs> that is me signing off.